You are listening to the Julie Parker Practice Success Podcast, where you discover management insights and strategies for your successful dental practice. There are also interviews with key people in the industry who have advice and services to help you and your team achieve great success. Welcome to this episode of the Julie Parker Practice Success Podcast. And I am so delighted to have this guy on here. Finally, I've been wanting since the day I started this podcast, I have been wanting Simon Palmer of Practice Sales Search to join me. And finally, he's here. Welcome, Simon. Thank you for having me. It's an absolute pleasure. You, Your line of work is one which has so many questions and curiosities around it and it's only when you go through the process that you know all of this stuff that's required to be known about that whole dental practice selling and buying space you would be appalled at my naivety when i bought my own first practice i had been a dental nurse and receptionist for years and years and years and i just looked up practices that were for sale this was back in um 2003 and just kind of showed up. I didn't really know what to ask for. I didn't even know well enough to ask for a profit and loss sheet. So my <laughs> ignorance was so profound. And so it was dumb luck that I ended up buying a fantastic practice, which had a, a great history. But people would come to you for all different ranges, with, with all different ranges of awareness around this space. But firstly, tell us a little bit about you, Practice Sale Search as well. I'm sure everyone knows about your company anyway, Australia wide. Um, yeah, thanks. Um, so I've been in the industry for about, I don't know, 20 years. Um, the last 15 or so I've been, um, involved in practice sales. Um, we've got about five brokers now, uh, four in Australia, one in New Zealand, uh, working full time. And, uh, we do about 120 odd transactions a year. Um, that's mostly spread uh, along the eastern states of Australia um, and obviously a few in New Zealand um, and as you said I mean it, it, it uh, runs the full gamut of every sort of I don't know size uh, that you could think of every reason why people want to sell um, you know people come to us for divorce for partnership breakups for um, you know retirement uh, just because you know they want to be doing something else um, and uh, you know we help anyone who uh, who comes to us I love that I didn't even kind of think about the partnership breakup as being one of the spaces that you'd be working in because retirement seems to be the most common reason why you would sell your dental practice but there can be a whole raft of different reasons and I suppose are you coming across people nowadays with so much more focus around mental health and developing a better work-life balance etc that they got into practice ownership and they thought oh I didn't get into this to work all my weekends and every evening <laughs> I'm owning it for a number of years but now I'm cutting out just for my own sense of self absolutely um yeah I think it's a it's a misnomer that uh, you know people are coming to the, uh, the decision to sell their business purely for financial reasons. I think um, a hell of a lot of the time um, it has to do with the opportunity cost of their time. It has to do with the fact that they want to be doing something else or that they're burnt out or they're overly stressed. Or they've, you know, uh, decided that, um, you know, practice ownership isn't for them. Um, a lot of the time it isn't at the end of a dentist's career that they come to us wanting to sell. It's, um, you know, they've still got a few years left in the tank, but they'd like to be winding down without the uh, stresses, the burdens of ownership hanging over their shoulders. Um, so, yeah, it's, uh, I think that that would be, um, the, the, the opportunity cost of time is, is, uh, far more prominent than people think in deciding to sell a practice. Yeah, yeah. And I think gone are the days that certainly if I refer back to my, my father, for example, he had his industry and he would have worked maybe three different jobs in that one industry through his whole career. Nowadays, they say that people will change their professions five times in their whole career. And so there seems to be far more of an idea or acceptance or 
uh, I don't know, it, I think in, in, in the day you'd say, no, I have my own practice now. I, this is where I'm going to retire. And it would make no sense in this day and age to do anything else other than that. But nowadays it seems to be more acceptable to say, well, I've had my time owning my own practice. Now I'm ready for something different. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm. Mm. And are you finding too that is there a common age group of dentists that are buying into their own practices? It seems like I, as a consultant, am coming across younger people, kind of fresh out of uni, taking that big step. Um, yeah, look, that does happen. I would say that uh, primarily it's people in their 30s. Um, so after they've spent a few years in practice that are deciding to get into, into practice ownership. I think it's, yes, there's the financial aspect to it and they want wealth creation. Um, but just as much as that, they're looking for control. They're looking to control. They want to work in their ideal sort of practice environment. Um, and they'd like to be able to, you know, decide when and where they work. Um, you know, uh, as opposed to having these things dictated to them by uh, the owner of the practice. Um, so I think that that enters into it a hell of a lot as well. Yeah, and I think that would then depend on their experience because certainly, you know, having worked in dental practices for, you know, coming up to 40 years, the, is it, yes, it's probably 40 years, the, there are some dentists that I've worked with that I saw them be quite generous and have this strong mentorship with the young dentists that were coming in as employees. But then there's the flip side too, that you bring the young dentist in, you push all the cleanings with them, they don't get quality new patients, they have to refer the crown and bridge back to the principal dentist. And so depending on the experiences that, it, that particular dentists have, I can certainly see some of them think the only way I'm gonna really have good control over not just my profession, but my livelihood and how much money I can develop, you know, to make is to actually do it myself. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, after a few years of as being an employee dentist or a, on an SFA in a practice, you, you learn things, um, you learn, you know, some best practice and some things that you want to take with you and you want to carry with you through your career. But you also see some things that you'd like to do things you'd like to do differently. Um, some things that uh, are not ideal um, and uh, they feel like the only way to get that in practice is, is to own their own shop. Yeah, yeah. So there's kind of two paths to this conversation I'd like to have with you. One is focusing on the buyer and what they should be looking out for with the practice, what they should be doing and all the things, but also from the selling perspective too. So from the buyer perspective, initially, when you have someone they've never owned their own practice before, they're coming to you and they say, I want to buy something. I can imagine that one of the conversations they might have is, you know, for me, for example, I live in Huntingdale in Melbourne. They would say, I live in Huntingdale, I want something in a 5K radius so my commute to work isn't too long. But to be able to put yourself in a practice that's really right for you, there needs to be a whole lot of other considerations taken into, in, coming into play. Yeah. What's your advice for a buyer? How should they come to you? What should their expectations be? How flexible should they be in terms of what their checklist is? It's a great question. Um, so I, I regularly get people coming to me just like that saying, Simon, I need you to find me a good practice in this area. Um, but they don't realize that what they're asking me is a subjective right and what's right for them is not going to be right across the board um and so i mean the, the best advice that i could can give them is to start looking at stuff and and give me feedback on what is working and what's not working on the stuff that they're looking at um i can suggest some practices to for them to look at and and get their fee their their feedback on that um the other thing that i'll tell them is to get a team behind them you know i i we, if uh, they're coming to a practice and they're saying i'd like to spend a certain amount of money well have you spoken to a financier about that um, do you know that you can borrow that amount of money um, have you got an accountant that you can rely on to get you know an opinion on this um, so i I'm often asking them, you know, do you have a lawyer? Do you have a, a finance guy? Have you spoken to an accountant about buying entities? You know, and, um, you know, how you're going to be structured when it comes time to buy. 
the last thing I want to see when I ha- when they're putting an offer down and that I w- I'd like to accept that offer is that they don't have any of these things behind them and they've been waiting for the right practice uh, to start investigating these. And there's there's no reason why they should be doing that. They should be in you know doing that in parallel to while they're doing their practice search. Yeah, because it is such a space where you know your dentistry, you know patient communication, you could possibly even know a bit of team management because it's what you've been doing and observing every day. But there are other entities at play. It's such a high risk situation if you're not going to get the right advice. You don't even know what could go wrong. Absolutely. Um, I also think, you know, if you were going to buy a house, you'd look at 10 houses uh, before you made something like that. Um, And while you're looking, you know, your uh, success criteria would change. You know, over time, you might decide that you actually need an extra, you know, bedroom or that you need parking. And the same thing happens when people start looking at practices. You know, they start off with one selection criteria and then as time goes by and as they're looking at things, they decide, you know what, I really need a window in my surgery. If, you know, that's how I'm going to feel comfortable if I have a window. Um, I need parking. I need uh, proximity to this or that. Um, so I think that, um, what's it called? The process is important. I think, you know, actually looking at this as, um, you know, no one's going to, you're not going to find your, your perfect practice, you know, looking at your first one. You're not going to know that it's perfect for you when you look at it. Um, it'll come for, by comparison. It'll come by you having a frame of reference uh, from having looked at a few practices. Yeah, and you want to expand that frame of reference out from just where you've worked it in the past. And it's an interesting analogy of you know, buying your own home because you, we do buy our own homes based on what we can afford at the time and we don't have any children and so it's usually a smaller place, smaller purchase and then we get pregnant, have a child, oh, it's getting too small for, you know, we've got the second child coming along, we need a, new, we need a bigger home now. Far easier to shift locations with that sort of scenario, far more difficult and challenging when we're talking about an established business, that if we move, if we do renovations, it's gonna be costly, we need to get rope the patients into it, will they travel if we do move to another location? And so getting that additional advice, and it's possibly even, you know, I don't wanna to toot a consultant horn, but maybe a more established dentist, you know, that if you've got in, if you've tapped into a network, get their opinion too. As you grew and your career evolved, what did you find you needed at your practice that it just wasn't there? For example, back 20 years ago, we didn't need OPG rooms, machine rooms. Now we do. Back in the day, you may have thought to yourself, no, 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 I just want a nice practice, maybe two or three practitioners and that's it. But then all of a sudden you you want to expand even further and parking is the one thing that's going to restrict you from expanding further. And we, as we said before, we don't know what we don't know. We don't know where our careers are going to take us to, but that we can only do that in our current location if we've purchased smartly at the very start. Absolutely. I think you have to look at it both in terms of what you would need now, but also, you know, what you're going to need for the next 10 years um, or more. Um, You know, yes, you need a bit of capacity for growth in there, for sure. Yeah. One of the things I've had my opinion asked of, do you think this is a good practice to buy? Do you think that one's a good practice to buy? And the uh, what I've noticed, and I'd love your opinion about this, is I feel like sometimes accountants can be quite conservative in their thought about what a practice could achieve and maybe consultants can be a bit too optimistic (laughs) but i what i would like to say and i'm not quite sure if it's appropriate to say don't just rely on an accountant's opinion go to someone else that connect that has actually experienced people doing things a little bit differently with the same existing practice but achieving quite different results without actually spending too much money and making renovations and things like that but just with the same opportunities that that one practice is delivered and sometimes is an accountant good at being able to foresee that do you think a separate opinion would be worthwhile um i look i think it's a great point i don't think an accountant is there necessarily to, to, to make projections of what the business could be. 
mm-hmm. right? I, I think it would take extraordinary sort of dental knowledge on behalf of the accountant to be able to tell, hey, you know, this practice is underservicing its uh, patient base or, you know, uh, there isn't a, um, you know, it's not doing any of these clinical treatments that could easily be added. Um, so, um, a, can you hear the dog in the background? Sorry, I can, about but that. that's okay. It's a nice sounding dog. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, I, I think an accountant is there in order to assess the profit of the practice and to uh, you know help you with the assessment of you know is this uh, legit? That's what's being presented in front of me. But in terms of making projections on, on, you know, for the future of that dental practice, I, I think absolutely you need far more dental knowledge than they'd be able to provide. Um, and I think this is one of the real weaknesses and pitfalls that buyers fall into is that they look, they focus too, far too much on what's there rather than what could be there under their management. You know, if they had two practices side by side that was doing, let's say, exactly the same uh, turnover and profit, they'd value them exactly the same, even if one was doing no advertising and the other one was, you know, spending quite a bit on advertising. If one was doing uh, no crown and bridge and the other one had, you know, quite a lot of uh, clinical range. Um, where clearly if you have a bit of dental knowledge, you can, you can say, okay, this one's got, you know, uh, a lot more blue sky ahead of it. Um, so, yeah, look, I think getting either a dental consultant or another dentist to guide you through that and to look at it, I think would be very valuable. Yeah. I'm pleased you said that because I completely agree with you. <laughs> So it's like a, the accountants, is, as you say, it legitimizes the figures and it is a snapshot of where things are right now. In terms of where things could be, that's not, as you say, that's not their role. That's not the role that they're, that they're functioning for well, you. Well, it's, it's, it's not what they have training for. It's yeah. not what they have experience to do, usually. Mm. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. Yeah. I can imagine that depending on the personality type that's coming to you saying, I want to buy a new practice, that they start having the rose colored glasses and they start seeing how this could possibly be a good opportunity and ignore maybe a few red flags that are at play because they just want to get that next stage of their career happening. And I suppose it would depend on how many practices are available for sale. If there's very few, they're possibly more likely to jump onto an investment that accountants and consultants and yourself may be saying, oh, maybe not this one for you. But in terms of red flags, things that you've seen that you thought, gosh, that's not something you can just ignore. That's a biggie. That's not just the fact that they're not marketing properly, but that's a biggie. What sort of red flags should buyers be looking out for? Um, I'm not sure that it is like that. I'm not sure that they are com- all coming at it with rose-coloured glasses. In fact, I, I kind of feel like it, it's often the opposite that's going on here. Mm-hmm. I think that dentists uh, are, you know, trained to look at m- minute problems, um, and they're often finding little problems that make no difference to the uh, future fortunes of a practice. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and exacerbating it. Um, so I, I think that, you know, I think that there's uh, far more of an epidemic of people coming at it with pessimism rather than, than the optimism that they need to. Um, in terms of, you know, the, the, the stuff that um, makes a difference that they're not paying enough attention to, uh, look, I think that there are enough checks and balances in there usually um between their lawyers and their accountants and the banks that, you know, if the lease is flimsy, for example, uh, you know, the bank won't lend money on that. Um, They'll check it and they'll highlight it as a problem or the the lawyer will. Um, So I, I, I find that it usually gets flushed out in the process anyway. Nice. And you're kind of reminding me back in years ago, someone said to me that, uh, the whole process of going into business for yourself, whether you're buying a business, that there are so many steps involved, so many complex steps involved, that 
it self-regulates and it gets rid of you before you get to the point of owning that business if you haven't got what it takes because you're going to give up for then and so it seems like it's a it's a self-regulating space as well and i think you're absolutely right the key is is to make sure as you said at the start get these people's opinions from word yeah. go don't don't kind of jump into it and then after the fact say oh you know now that i bought the practice let's get all the leases checked off by the lawyer <laughs> Exactly. With the that kind of discerning eye that buyers are bringing to the table, is that a does that end up being a bit of a frustration for the seller of the practice? What's the journey like for the seller when they've got someone who you know? I, I get my the, when I bought my practice, the it was a very much relaxed environment, and it was very lucky that everything just went along very smoothly. And he was very much like, let's not worry about this or that. Let's just get it all done. Nice, simple. It was I think it was a four page contract. It was all very simple, and wildly different nowadays, absolutely for sure. But is it for the seller? What should they kind of come in prepared for? Should they come in prepared? to have it quite a lengthy process possibly or having to make particular adjustments and things in order to make their practice as saleable as they kind of wanted it to be? Um, well, there's a lot to unpack in that question. Um, so in order to prepare for their practice, yeah, look, I, I, think, I think most people would agree that it's better if you're able to come at it, you know, with, you know, three years left in the tank. Um, so that there's enough runway for you to make course adjustments if you need to. Um, a hell of a lot of the time I'll look at a, a practice's financials and it might make perfect sense to them, but over the decades that they've owned the practice, there's a, a shorthand uh, that has, has come to play in these financials and it's very hard for an outsider to understand it. There have been, you know, catch-all expense categories uh, that have just amalgamated a whole bunch of things um, or you know they they simply don't have uh, contracts in in place with staff or uh, they don't know where their lease is or their lease is not um, you know is not suitable for a sale um, so coming at it with uh, a few years up your sleeve really gives you a chance to you know make sure that when you do hit the market you're doing it with a set of uh, documents that puts you in the best possible light to get the best possible outcome. Um, so, you know, I, I, yeah, I think that that's important. Um, in terms of what they should be um, expecting when they go to market in terms of what's coming back from the buyers, it comes back to that preparation. Um, it comes back to, you know, how well prepared they are. I think you know what I've heard and seen out there is that a, a, a vendor that goes to market on their own um, spends a hell of a lot of time wording the perfect sort of classified ad to put out there. Um, and then as soon as people are coming back to them, um, they're not very prepared with you know readable financials, with um, you know uh, dental software reports that are needed. Um, and so they're they're constantly playing this catch-up game where uh, you know it's taking them a few days to get what people need uh, people are getting frustrated at the lack of transparency and the lack of readability of some of the documents that are given um, I think you know there's that saying you know if you had you know what was it uh, four hours to, to cut down a tree you'd spend the the first three sharpening the axe and and I think that that's you know that plays well into what we're doing here, where you know I think you have to make sure that you know you've taken enough time in preparation to make sure that you've got a prospectus or an information memorandum which acts almost like a, a, a frequently asked questions that someone would ask and has all of the answers to what everyone's going to ask about the practice, uh, and you've got that document at the ready beforehand, and that's that's really where I come in. That's where people like I like I come in. Beautiful. Because I suppose even though, again, getting the accountants and lawyers yourself to do all your stuff, it doesn't require it to be a trusting relationship because you've got those checks in place to make sure that even if, you know, it's all any anything dishonest is going to be revealed anyway. But it's that transparency that it will leave potentially buyers feeling like i just don't feel like i've got enough information i feel like i should be holding back and it may not have me something that they're completely conscious about but if you are quite stumbling through this process of getting all your bits and pieces together and i've 
borne witness to a uh, one process where I was asked to give my opinion. I said, get all these dental reports. And they said, no, it's private information that we don't want to give it forward. You think that's crazy. Like, what do they expect you to do? So having that preparedness is just such a crucial step for so many ways. It's going to set up a very good relationship at the start. So it's free reeling it's going to make it shorter it's going to lessen that frustration uh, because i can imagine this dentist in between patients and managing staff now they're trying to get all these reports and satisfy the buyer's questions uh, it can just be a fr big frustration so it reduces all of that down as well yeah and on top of that on top of that ideals have a momentum if interest has a momentum you know when someone's excited and they want to buy something you know the, the last thing you one is for the momentum to stop because, you know, you forgot to ask your accountant something and he's on holidays now and you've got to wait for a month for him to get back. Okay. Um, or, you know, you need to be able to get a report from the software and you don't know how to get it and uh, you've got to get some instructions on how to get it. Now, like when there's excitement to do a deal, you really need to, you know, seize the day and take that opportunity to try to keep the momentum going. Yeah, it's... Not, this question kind of comes out of left field because I'm going to come back to the team in a minute. But what's what is the general time that it takes to sell a practice? I'm sure it goes it, it varies wildly. What's a rough gauge? So we quote um, about three to four months from engagement to settlement, um, and most of that time is not to do with finding you a buyer or negotiating a deal. So uh, at least half, if not more, of that time is spent with lawyers. Um, and I know that's a, that's a bit strange for people who are used to real estate deals to hear because they're used to, you know, the, the, the contracts being done at the end of an auction in, in an hour or something like that maybe. Um, but there's three contracts usually in a practice sale. So there's a, a practice sale agreement. There's a premises lease or a premises sale agreement, and then there's a work contract for the vendor post sale. And there's three lawyers, if you think about it. There's a buyer's lawyer, a seller's lawyer, and a landlord's lawyer. Um, and you know the, the, the contract just goes back and forth between these three lawyers, and no lawyer ever looks at the work of another lawyer and says, that's fine. You know, It takes a few days, if not a week, turnaround whenever it lands on another lawyer's desk. And part of my job, part of our job is to, you know, make sure that the momentum isn't lost during that period and that, you know, we, uh, uh, that the lawyers are acting in a timely manner um, and trying to minimise the amount of contention between the lawyers before it even gets to them. You know, try to have as tight a deal as possible before it gets to them. But even with that, it, it can take easily, you know, five, six weeks in just the legals alone. Um, so, you know, we quote, as I said, four months from beginning to end. Two, three weeks of that is in preparation in us, you know, sharpening the axe, um, so to speak. About five to seven weeks maybe or five to six weeks is finding the buyer and getting the deal together. And then it gets into the legal process. Yeah, yeah. Gosh, I hadn't thought of it from that legal perspective, but I am married to a lawyer and I can see that be absolutely the case. <laughs> Charles used to be a lawyer for 24 years and um, hasn't been a lawyer, been Australasia's passion provocateur for the past 27, 28 years. But he is my legal go-to. The minute we, I get any person saying, quickly look at this contract, I throw it in front of his eyes and he's got that discerning eye. He can pick up things like crazy. Well, lucky you've got someone on hand like that. Most people I know, it's don't. very handy. I have to say very handy, very handy. Um, when you were talking before about team member contracts, employment contracts, that must be one of the biggest disruptions to the space <laughs> because certainly not all dental practices still have got employment contracts, proper employment contracts in place for their team members. Hmm. Yeah, look, I, I guess it comes down to, um, and there's different quality when you do, even if they do have the uh, contracts in place, right? Um, and it comes really down to um, whether we're talking about the, the clinical team or the staff. Um, a lot of the time, uh, you know, the clinical team uh, becomes an important part of the deal. 
um, you know, having their sign on and having them, you know, transfer. Um, so yeah, it's 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 a part that uh, you know becomes that we need a process for that we need um, to manage quite well. And is it also an area because that team can become quite important? So we're thinking about a happy team, a functional <laughs> team that have been around for a long time. They know the patients well. They that kind of team would absolutely be an asset if they were to transfer over to the new owner, and. Given that people can pick up on secrets even if they're not being made privy to them, given that a lot of people just don't like change as well, what's your personal advice? Do you have personal advice about how to manage the team aspect? So if you were a seller about to sell your, or thinking about selling your practice, they've contacted you, they've got all their information together, how soon to tell those team members? I don't think there's a one-size-fits-all answer to that. Um, I think, you know, uh, practice owners' relationship with their staff is different. Different staff members, even within the same practice, um, you know, have different levels of discretion that's needed. Um, I can tell you that, you know, some practices, most practices don't tell their staff that they're thinking about selling until it's uh, almost at the finish line. Some mm -hmm. practices um, have a, a level of transparency with with all of their staff and say that, you know, listen, my practice is on the market. Um, I completely respect, you know, both points of view and uh, I'm, you know, happy to work with either. Um, but it, it, it has to come from deciding which way to go is, is completely down to the vendor, you know, to assess um, how they feel it would best work. And with the situations where the owner does stay on and continue to work for a series of months after the practice sale to help with the changeover, do you get a look in to see how that rolls out going down the track? Again, I've seen it work very, very well in my history, but I've also heard stories about not working so well as well. Yeah, look, I mean, I think uh, a bad story travels far quicker and far, far, far further than a good story somehow. Um, but I think there's far more good stories than bad. Um, we follow up with all of our practice sales, you know, a year or so afterwards um, and just sort of check how they're going. I mean, some of them uh, have, you know, move on after their stipulated time, you know, doing a smooth transition. Um, but very rarely is it because, you know, they've hated the experience of working there. Um, and a hell of a lot of the time, you know, they, when I check in on them, they're still in the practice long after they needed to be. You know, they, they're actually sticking around because the burnout that they were experiencing wasn't the burnout from clinical dentistry. It was a burnout from the burdens of ownership. It was a burnout from having to deal with uh, staff issues and IT issues while they were on holidays or on their weekends. Um, and once they become just a dentist again, they actually find it nice. They find it a good balance. Um, I think it's also quite hard for someone, if they were selling, to go into retirement, to go from full-time to nothing straight away. I think that it's a far easier transition for them if they're you know, going into retirement a day at a time, going from you know, four days a week in the practice to three days to two days to one day a week, you know, over a period of a couple of years helps them get used to retirement. Um, and it's usually something that the new practice owner, the buyer, welcomes. You know, it, it helps with the transition of patients. It helps show continuity to everyone. Um, it's what, what we call a, an implied endorsement that the old owner is giving the new owner. Um, so, um, you know, I don't, yeah, the, the story is different um, depending on, you know, who you talk to. Some of that, I think, will come down to um, the buyer and how, you know, drastically different the buyer's vision for the practice was from the, from, from the seller. But sometimes, you know, it, it's, um, most of the time, it's, it's a very smooth process. Nice. One of my experiences was working with a guy who bought the practice from someone who I think he was like fifth generation dentist. He <laughs> started off in Collins Street in Melbourne, ended up in one of the southeastern suburbs. And so he was seeing the, the seller was seeing great grandchildren of the original patient. So 
And it was interesting. The new owner was very respectful of the previous owner and he wanted to renovate the whole place. He wanted to bring in new services. The original owner really wasn't interested in any, in any of it. But you know, um, for whatever wonderful reason it was, the new owner said to the old owner, we're just going to keep your practice exactly the way it is. So it had old 70s yellow and orange. And the minute you walk out of that room into the hallway, everything's grey and modern and beautiful. <laughs> like two separate worlds under the one roof, but it worked very well. But, I mean, it shows, you know, the commitment that uh, the buyer had to, to and, and how important it was to the buyer that the vendor stayed on and gave that, you know, transition. Um, and I think I, I see that in most transactions. I see it in most transactions that uh, the buyer wants the vendor to stick around as long as he can. And it seems like a lot of the dentists, you find this with dentists who are retiring or selling their practice, they care passionately about the patients and what they're going to experience after they're gone. They don't want it to be disruptive for them. And they feel this emotional tie to that patient base as well. Do you find this in negotiations that the seller is saying, look, everything looks right. I just don't like the guy. I don't think he's going to treat my patients well enough. Is that an issue? Oh, absolutely. Um, I, I find it admirable. It's, it's it's a lovely quality that dentists have that they 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 feel that this ownership uh, or, or this responsibility um, for leaving their patients in the right hands. Um, quite often, you know, we'll have three or four offers for a practice, um, and um, the the vendor will choose won't choose the highest uh, financial offer that's given. They'll choose one that is the right balance and, and has the right compatibility and the right vision for what their practice is. Yeah, very good. And when it comes to negotiations, and so I can imagine this is an area where, by the sounds of it, this space could possibly quite be short-lived because the lawyers are taking up a <laughs> while well, majority of the time that it takes the whole process to go through. But there must be room for negotiation. So there's, you know, the stated sale price that the seller would like to sell it for, the new buyer comes in and says, well, team's not going to come on board or, you know, it really does have certain restrictions in terms of the lease, et cetera. To come in with those, that, you know, flexibility, both sides to come in with that flexibility because you'll eventually settle on a price that today, that's what this practice is worth, given all the people's advice and input. No, absolutely. I mean, there's, there's always a negotiation and it's not just a negotiation of price, it's a negotiation of terms as well. And, you know, there's a compatibility aspect that comes into those negotiations as well. You know, there are some guys who will come in um, and say every negative thing that they can about the practice in order to drive the price down. Um, and, um, you know, there are other people who will need to drive the price down, but will do it by complimenting the vendor and saying, listen, I love the practice. You know, I think, it, you know, it's incredible the, the legacy that you've built here. I just can't afford it. Um, and it's amazing to me to see that, you know, the vendor will is much more likely to negotiate and to compromise for someone that they like and someone who appreciates their baby, they feel, than someone who's pointing out everything that's negative about the place. That's um, a really good insight. You know, they, uh, so th there's a compatibility aspect that comes into the negotiation as well. Yeah, that's a really good piece of advice. And I think to come into any kind of negotiation, like try to be on each other's side because that's going to go for a more of a win-win scenario. Otherwise, you know, don't be unlikable about it. Look, it's a courtship as much as it's a financial negotiation. You, you, you want this guy to like you. You know, or, or whoever it is. Yeah, that's it. That's it. So from the perspective, you were saying before that if you were looking to buy a practice, give yourself enough time to be able to look for your few practices, get that experience, know, start to know what to look for and what considerations to take. So would you say, you know, a couple of years of looking around or just a few months? How many practices are for sale for them to go out and have a look at? Jeez, uh, it depends on, on what you're looking for, really, and where. Um, you know, if you're looking in a capital city, you know, there's plenty of practices for sale, but then it, for, for those people that might come down to, uh, I don't know, the, the part of, of town that you're looking at as well, um, the size of the practice and the turnover, um, I don't know. And I, and I think, it, you know, I think 
different people require different amounts of preparation um, as well. Some people can feel incredibly confident that the practice that's in front of them meets all of their criteria and they want to go ahead and they're happy to go ahead at the asking price or close to it. For other people, you know, they require more research and they require, you know, to have looked at a few more things in order to come to that same level of confidence. Um, so, yeah, it just comes down to the buyer. And certainly, you know, log on to your details and get your newsletters coming out <laughs> and your notifications of practices for sale coming out straight away because that by itself starts to get your, you in the right headspace of the different types of practices that are up for sale. And from the seller's perspective, you were saying sell when you've got another three years left in the tank at least because, I mean, number one, the financials, the accountant's going to want to see a good, strong performance over the last three consistent years, not something that just, you know, for the last year we've tried really hard. <laughs> so just look at the last year's production. <laughs> well, I mean, look, the, mo the most recent year is the most important. I, I don't think it's right to say that, well, you average the last three years. Mm -hmm. Um, I think, you know, to say that is to say that what happened three years ago is just as important as what happened in the last 12 months. You know, I think people are going to place far more importance on the most recent year. Um, I don't know if you, you, know, you want to sell when you've got, you know, three years left in the tank, but you, I think before you even want to start selling, I think you want to start, you know, looking at it, um, getting your practice appraised. Um, start, you know, talking to your accountant about it. Often your accountant will, you know, turn around and say, listen, it's not time yet. You need to give it another couple of years. Um, you know, there are some uh, capital gains tax uh, reasons why you may want to, you may need to sell in a couple of years as opposed to now. Um, so these are conversations that you want to start having well in advance, for sure. Yeah, yeah. And... Does it play any particular role in the, is it an asset of the business in terms of, do you have all your systems documented, are all your team members really well trained up and you've got a history of training these team members as well? Does that come into it at all? I'm afraid not. <laughs> <laughs> got to change what I say to my clients. You've got to get systematized because it's an asset to your business. <laughs> The training of the team is not an asset and uh, doesn't increase value by itself. But where it adds value is when the training has made the practice more successful. A well-trained practice that has put systems and protocols in place for everything is probably more likely to be answering the phone better and reappointing and confirming patients. It's more likely to be ensuring that the patient experience through the practice is excellent so that the patients are coming back and referring friends. Uh, when the training's done that sort of thing, it should increase the patient billings and profit of the, of the business. And that would make the practice worth more. Did COVID have any kind of negative impact on the bravery people had when it came to buying a practice? Or did you have more people saying, I'm going out of here, this is all too hard? What kind of impact did the lockdowns and COVID have? Oh, geez, it was enormous. Um, so, look, firstly, immediately um, in March, what was it, 2020, when, um, when it happened, every deal that we were in the middle of stopped. Um, no one wanted to proceed with anything because no one knew what was happening, if the world was ending, or, you know, when commerce would uh, restart. Um, slowly, you know, the um, confidence came back, but then there were lockdowns and no one wants to buy a business that might have rent but no income. Um, so it was a very sort of sketchy next year when, you know, there was stop starting and, um, and then the year after that, it was hard to look back at the most recent year and say, what is this practice, you know, as far as the financial performance, you know, we've got, you know, uh, nine months of trading here because there was, uh, this six week shutdown and then there was that shutdown. Um, but we don't really know what it would have done if it was 12 months do we just you know pro rata it or you know how do how do we how do we look at this um on top of that i think um the the lack of mobility of buyers hurt us as well 
um, you know, there's a percentage of buyers that I've got in the capital cities that are coming from other places. Um, and they weren't able to, you know, travel freely just to even look at a practice. Um, so, you know, that, that hurt us on top of, you know, those other things that I was mentioning. Um, the fact that the borders were shut internationally and the skill shortage uh, or, or the skill shortages that would kind of come out of that, I think hurt uh, a lot of the regional practices that I was trying to sell um, because a lot of people would have, you know, they plan on recruiting, they plan on recruiting from overseas or they've got a history of recruiting from overseas and they're not really sure what's, how, how that, you know, if they're going to be able to do that in the post-COVID world. Mm. Um, so, yeah, it was, it, was, it was a couple of years of um, sort of feeling as we go and, and trying to rewrite the rule books. Um, on top of that, and just to make matters more complicated, is that, you know, you had the, the drop in interest rates um, that were going on, which uh, pushed other people into a buying mode. Um, and, and pushed us, push, push them towards investing. Um, so it was a very different time for us um, and for anyone, I think, selling businesses. And I don't know if it's still the case. You may have more information about this than I do, but I was about a year ago, two years ago, hearing about the cost of equipment and fit-outs for dental was going through the roof because of you know, um, the impact from the pandemic as well. And if that's still the case, then certainly is it more viable than financially to buy an existing practice rather than kit out something yourself? I've got one particular story in my mind where with the interest rate hikes and the fit out hikes going up, they would never have gone down that path if they'd known all the final costs and what they were going to end up being. Anecdotally, I get uh, people talking like that as well um, and saying that that's pushing buyers in our direction, buyers that would have set up from scratch. Are, um, are buying instead, um, but it's hard to get any statistics on, on what that looks like. Yeah, yeah. So if there are buyers and sellers out there and they want to start this process with you, what is it like? What are you, how do you take people through this three to four month process? Um, buyers or sellers? Well, from the buyer's perspective, uh, it's, it's like I said, I mean, I think um, the best possible thing that you can be doing is register with us, get some alerts coming through of practices for sale that, that meet your criteria. Um, you can set up an alert just like you can on Seek or on Domain or on, on any of those websites where you just say, okay, well, I'm looking for something in Melbourne, I'm looking for something with a few surgeries, um, and we'll start to send you some emails uh, with some very vague descriptions that you can get more information about, and you can start your journey of investigation and looking at practices, we can schedule some times for you to have a walkthrough, um, you know, start, you, you can, yeah, we'll start, if you want, uh, recommending a lawyer or an accountant or a, a finance person for you to talk to. Um, so th those would be the best first steps for a, a buyer. For a seller, um, look, there, it, it depends where you're up to. Um, if you are within a few years of thinking about selling, we do run exit seminars um, in all capital cities. Um, on top of that, I would recommend maybe just getting a, a free appraisal done. We do free appraisals for people uh, just to let them know whereabouts they're sitting and what they can be expecting if they were to sell, which helps them with their future planning and uh, not. You know, it helps them make adjustments with their practice if they have enough time or make plans for their retirement. Um, so that might be another another path to go down. Um, but it, yeah, you also could uh, give us a call and uh, just have a confidential chat about your circumstances and we can give you advice that way. And how often are you running the um, the courses that you're talking about, the, web, the seminars and things that you're talking about? Um, we try to run at least one uh, each year in, in each uh, of the Eastern States and, and in Adelaide. So um, we run them, uh, I think we run them with the ADA in uh, New South Wales and Victoria. Um, and, uh, but we run them in Brisbane and Adelaide as well. We run them in Auckland on top of that. Um, yeah. Fantastic. Fantastic. Well, the website is practicesalesearch.com.au. I've been following you since you were job search. <laughs> 
That was a long time many, ago. Many yeah. decades ago. Well, I shouldn't say many, many decades ago. 20, 20 to 30 years ago. Uh, but practicesalesearch.com.au, this is such an enormous decision whether you're buying or selling your practice and it can go either way in so many different ways and so getting all the right advice is the most appropriate step to make sure that you're protecting yourself and that it's going to hopefully end up being a win-win that's the intention is not it? that both the buyer and the seller end up being quite happy with the negotiations and the ending deal absolutely thank you so much simon for for being on the program any final pieces of advice uh, nothing that I can think of. Um, thanks a lot for having me on. It's been a great conversation. Um, yeah, I've enjoyed it a lot. Me too. Thank you, Simon. It's going to be a, a very pertinent one for many people out there. I keep speaking to uh, about about the, the opportunity of taking this step in your career. And as you say, it can end up beautifully. You can have end up with a practice that really does meet your needs going into the future and then the seller is off enjoying the next phase of their life after leaving their legacy behind. <laughs> well, that's the hope. Yeah. That's the hope. Thanks, Simon. Speak to you next time. Right. See you. Bye. If you enjoyed this podcast, then I encourage you to head over to Amina and my website, Dental Business Mastery dot com dot au you will find all the information that you need if you would like to gain our assistance in helping you and your team achieve great success we've got online courses consulting programs the club membership we also have a whole bunch of tools and resources that are available for free that will help you achieve your practice goals if you would like to find out more you can also email us directly at info at dentalbusinessmastery.com.au. Thanks so much for listening.